This is the day this year, <laughs> the Lord has made. I was like, this is like a jam ready to break. <laughs> this is the day the Lord has made. Let's say it together. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Man, that's like joy just ready to like bust out and just flood all over the place. So what a great day to be in the house of the Lord. I want to welcome all of you who are here, those of you who are guests, those of you who Yeah, I'm going to use Sherry's mic, <laughs> and, and, and we'll figure this out. But I'll tell you, it's like, wait a minute, I want to speak, I want to speak. So, uh, you know, the Lord calls and gathers us as his baptized children into his presence this day. As we call on the Lord our God in his name, our, the God our Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and as the writer, the Hebrew says, therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have boldness to enter the sanctuary through the blood of Jesus, he has inaugurated for us a new and living way through the curtain that is through his flesh. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed in pure water. He invites us to draw near with hearts that are cleansed by the blood of Jesus. And so let's do that. If you'd bow your heads with me and let us bring to the Lord all of our cares, our burdens, our failings, our sin, our unbelief. Let's confess those to the Lord and ask for him to cleanse and purify our hearts this day. O oh, good and gracious God, you are our loving Heavenly Father. And it's by your mercy that you invite us even as sinners, as broken people, people struggling with guilt and shame and anxiety and fear, to come and, and honestly, boldly confess our sin to you, to turn to you, and to confess how much we need your grace, that we have sinned in so many ways, that we have not fully surrendered our lives in faith and trust to you as our God, that we have not given you the worship and the praise, that we have not lived lives of faithful, constant prayer, that we have not lived and followed Jesus in, in unconditional, faithful love with others. 
we are sinful in thought, word, and deed. Have mercy on us for the sake of Christ and his shed blood that you would forgive, renew, cleanse, and give us new hearts. Oh, Father, we pray in your holy and precious name. Amen. And I declare that the blood of Jesus was shed on Calvary's cross for you and that his blood washes away all of your sins as you turn to him as a servant of Christ. I with great joy declare to you this day that in the name of Jesus, your sins are forgiven that you are cleansed and purified in heart and life this day, and he gives you a new heart, a clean heart, a true, pure heart in his presence and fills you with his Holy Spirit this day. So let us receive that, and let us give him the thanks and the praise. Amen? As the psalm, psalmist says in Psalm 95, Come, let's shout joyfully to the Lord. Let's shout triumphantly to the rock of our salvation. Let's enter his presence with thanksgiving. Let's shout triumphantly to him in song. For the Lord is a great God, a great king above all gods. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the sheep under his care. So let's, with strong, vibrant voices, let's give him the praise this morning. our King, come let us bow at His feet, He has done great things, see what our Savior has done, see how His love overcomes, He has done great things, He has done great things.
you free and recaptain and break every chain oh god you have done great things we dance in your freedom awake and alive oh jesus our savior your name lifted high oh god you have done great things you have done
God, you alone are God, the only God, the holy God, and we worship you, we worship and honor you this day, for there is no God like you, the creator of the heavens and the earth, you are the God who has not only made us, you are the God who has redeemed us. That through your only begotten son, Jesus, we worship and praise you for the great things you have done, for your redeeming love and grace. That through Jesus, our good shepherd, who laid down his life for us, that you have set us apart for yourself. You have made us your holy people. And we pray that you would be at work in our hearts and lives by your Holy Spirit. Through the rule and reign of Jesus, our good shepherd, who leads and guides us, that you would protect and guard us from all the attacks of the enemy who would seek to tear us away from you, but that your spirit working through Christ in our hearts and lives may preserve and guard us in our faith that we may be kept for you, our holy God, our good and gracious and merciful God, that you would preserve us as your people to the very end, that no matter what trials or dangers or hardships that we face in this world, Oh, God, that you would keep and preserve us through Jesus, your son, our shepherd king, in the presence and power of your Holy Spirit, one God. We pray to you now and forever. And all God's people said, amen. amen. You may be seated. And This morning, as we continue to worship the Lord, we restart our offering. So we're actually going to pass offering basket. Seems like it's been like forever. So I know some of you give electronically. That's fine. If you brought your offering, you can pass that basket. Got to remember how to do this. And, uh, and give as the Lord has blessed you. Let us give to the Lord to bless the ministry of the gospel.
this 20th Sunday after Pentecost in the church year. Our first reading, Old Testament reading appointed for this day is from the prophet Amos, where God commissions Amos to speak to the people of Israel because their prosperity had hardened their hearts against him and caused rampant injustice. And he urges them to seek the Lord to live. Otherwise, the fire of his love will consume all that is opposed to God. Amos chapter 5, 6 and 7, and 10 to 15. Seek the Lord and live, or he will spread like fire throughout the house of Joseph, and it will consume everything, with no one at Bethel to extinguish it. Those who turned justice into wormwood also throw righteousness to the ground. They hate the one who convicts the guilty at the city gate, and they despise the one who speaks with integrity. Therefore, because you trample on the poor and exact a grain tax from him, you will never live in the houses of cut stone you have built. You will never drink the wine from the lush vineyards you have planted. For I know your crimes are many and your sins innumerable. They oppress the righteous, take a bribe, and deprive the poor of justice at the city gates. Therefore, those who have insight will keep silent at such a time, for the days are evil. Pursue good and not evil, so that you may live. And the Lord, the God of armies, will be with you as you have claimed. Hate evil and love good. Establish justice at the city gate. Perhaps the Lord, the God of armies, will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. This is the word of the Lord. And our reading, epistle reading, is from Hebrews, speaking to the early Christians and also to us, warning us that our hearts not be hardened, nor turn away from the Lord. Hebrews chapter 3, and this will serve as the basis for our message this morning. Hebrews 3, 12 to 19. Watch out, brothers and sisters, so that there won't be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. But encourage each other daily, while it is still called today, so that none of you is hardened By sin's deception. For we have become participants in Christ if we hold firmly into the end the reality that we had at the start. As it is said today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. For who heard and rebelled? Wasn't it all who came out of Egypt under Moses? With whom was God angry for 40 years? Wasn't it with those who sinned? whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would never enter his rest, if not to those who disobeyed? So we see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. This is the word of the Lord. And finally, from the Gospel of Mark, where Jesus encounters a rich young ruler who who doesn't want to uh, part with his wealth. Verse 17, as Jesus was setting out on a journey, a man ran up, knelt down before him and asked, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus asked him. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and your mother. He said to him, Teacher, I've kept all these from my youth. Looking at him, Jesus loved him and said to him, You lack one thing. Go, sell all you have and give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. But he was dismayed by this demand, and he went away grieving because he had many possessions. This is the word of the Lord. Please pray with me.
Heavenly Father, I ask that you would speak clearly to us through your word, that we would hear the voice of your spirit speaking to us right at our point. Uh, Lord, where we need to be dealt with in our hearts, in our lives. That you would have your way with us. In your name we pray. Everyone said, amen. I want to begin with a, a video. It's a two-minute, 30-second video. Um, it looks like a, it's a black and white, looks like an old 1950s black and white animated video that was done recently. And it portrays very vividly where our culture's at. There's a couple disturbing images in it, but it's a powerful video that will get a point across. you silent after you see that. We live in a very precarious and dangerous time. When our technology, including tools like this, cell phone, smartphone, which can be and are used for great good, have a terrible inherent capacity for evil. And the enemy of our souls, the devil, he wants to enslave us. He wants us to make us cell phone technology zombies to spiritually hollow out and deaden us. And you know, its capacity for evil is probably greater than we have even realized. And we're just now beginning to see the fruits of it. And we've all made mistakes. I know as parents, even as a pastor, I've made mistakes. I would redo things with what I know now to go back five years ago. A strong case can be made and is being made that though, you know, tools can be used for good or bad, they're not all the same. And 
technology like a smartphone has a more built-in inherent pull towards evil than, say, a book does. Yeah, and this is probably why the tech giants and those who are CEOs of tech companies, they know this. They know this. A couple of quotes from a book called Redeeming Technology. You know, the first president of Facebook, Sean Parker, he publicly lamented that even helped create the popular social media platform, Facebook. And he said, God only knows what Facebook is doing to our children's brains. Exactly. And then uh, another former Facebook executive, Chamath, I'm not even going to pretend to pronounce his last name. Um, he suggested that social media platforms, and listen to this, are destroying how society works. And Tim Cook, Apple CEO, the one who designed the smartphone, he said, I won't let my nephew even have one. What is it that they know? They know, as all design experts know, that it was designed with what's called a user design. So as authors of this book point out, design is far more influential than is readily apparent. This kind of technology is actually designed for sin. Devices like this are made to exploit temptations. Gadgets prey like upon sinful inclinations. And he says, you might think this sounds ludicrous. But this is something the designers themselves recognize in their own statements. This is called in the new field of design, it's called user experience design. It's built in to be a consumption device that gets you addicted and you crave more and more. And you see, the powers of darkness are, are, are using it to, to draw us in to be self-absorbed with a narcissistic, narcissistic self-centeredness that provokes feelings of envy, pride, anger. You know, and, and here we think we're virtually connected to so many people, and yet it isolates. And it causes depression. It causes despair. But greatest of all, it distracts us. Yeah, all the images flashing on our phones and all the information, especially in all the chaos of this age and all the propaganda and fake narratives that, you know, with the images that get poured into our minds to form and shape us, it distracts us from the living God. And it can easily destroy people's faith. And it is. It has. You know, as people cling and hold on to this with the flashing images, it becomes the word idol means an image. It can easily become the God that has the central focus of our attention and hollows us out on the inside. And we become spiritual zombies. It's at a time like this that we need the warning that the letter of Hebrews brings to God's people then and also now. The warning that we not be led astray from him. The warning that we hold on for dear life to Jesus and his word when there is so much in our culture right now that the enemy is using to tear us away, to draw us away from him. It's kind of like someone driving in a car on a road and wants to take an exit and then sees that exit road is barricaded off with a big sign that says, road closed, warning, bridge is out. Now you could just say, well, I don't care. You know, I'm going to take that road anyway. And you can go around the barricade. And maybe you think, well, I'll just do a Dukes of Hazard, my General Lee. Sorry, I'm dating myself there. That was a car where, you know, he had this way of, of just taking his car flying through the air, going through obstacles and ravines, and I'm just going to go over to the other side. Well, you shouldn't be surprised if your car ends up falling into a ravine. Warning. Warning, this path of the world is one of destruction. 
you know, I have to admit, last Monday when Facebook was down for, I think, five hours, and, and there were some experts that were like, you know, it could be because of the code or whatever. It could be, like, deleted and gone. Tracy was there. I was like, yes! I was at home, I'm like, yes, let it be. Let it be burned down. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry for my, I'm like, oh, yes, let it be, like, gone for good. I, I was actually ecstatic at the prospect that it was gone, done, never to come back. Now, sorry, I know some people, their livelihood is using Facebook. But it, it's just that technology, social media, it has such a death grip on our lives. It's like, we need to heed this warning from the Lord. Now, Hebrews, we have no idea who wrote it. There's lots of speculation. We don't even know who the audience is. It's not directed to a particular church. We know it's Christians likely in Italy, perhaps Rome. They had a great knowledge of the Old Testament. There's lots of Old Testament details in it. And so likely, it is probably Jewish Christians, Jews who converted and came to Christ. And maybe they're in Rome, and the situation is now there's persecution rising. Now there's hardship. And you see, things got to a point where the emperor exempted the Jews. The Jews weren't being persecuted, but the Christians were being targeted. And so those Jewish Christians who had converted and came to Christ, now the heat's being turned up. Now the pressure is on them to deny Christ. And they're like, well, you know, if I go back to Judaism, I won't get persecuted. And so the writer of Hebrews is saying, what can you go back to? Jesus is superior to everything. He transcends it all. He's the fulfillment of it all. There's no going back. He says, warning, warning, warning. Don't take this road. So Hebrews is filled with a lot of dire warnings. You turn away from Christ, you're just driving around the barricade and the warning sign on a road that has the bridge out to your own destruction. And that warning comes to us today. And the writer urges us, first of all, don't let your hearts be turned away from God's word of life. Don't let your hearts be turned away. And you see, right before our text, in Hebrews 3, in verses 7 to 8, and actually the sections 7 through 11, the writer quotes Psalm 95. Two instances in the life of Israel. And, and this psalm, Psalm 95, which I read pieces of at the beginning of the service, this is the second half of it. This was a liturgical psalm used in the worship of Israel when they went to Jerusalem. And the end of it was a warning to them not to follow the example of their ancestors in two incidents in their history. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart as in the rebellion. If you hear his voice speaking through his word, through his mouthpiece, Moses, in Exodus 6, 17, when, when God had rescued his people from, from Pharaoh and out of Egypt and was bringing them to Mount Sinai, and he promised them through Moses, his mouth, his voice, his voice to them, he was going to provide for them. He gave them manna in the wilderness. He gave them meat. He gave them quail. He was going to quench their thirst. But in Exodus 17, they're not right away seeing the water. They want it on their terms. And they're like, well, we don't think God's going to provide for us. We don't even think God is present with us. And so they rebel against God's voice to them through Moses. And they're like, well, we think we just need to go back. Maybe we need to go back to Egypt. And that place was called Meribah and Massa. Because they rebelled, they quarreled. With God. And the second verse, so I swore in my anger they will not enter my rest. Because after one year, they came to a place called Kadesh Barnea in the wilderness on the precipice of going into the promised land. And God says, Don't be afraid. 
don't be discouraged. I'm going to lead you into the land. I'm going to drive out your enemies. You can send scouts into the land. And they did. They sent 12 scouts who scouted out the land. And like, oh, man, it's gorgeous, beautiful. Land flowing, milk and honey. It's prosperous. Oh, it's wonderful. But there's giants. And you got big cities. I don't know. I don't think we can do it. And so 10 of them just get all fearful, unbelieving. Now, Caleb and Joshua, two of the scouts, are like, no, God's promise. He's going to lead us into the land. But the ten fearful, doubting, unbelieving voices went out. And all the people get worked up. Oh, we can't do it. We can't do it. In fact, they even formed a committee to call the Go Back to Egypt committee. <laughs> oh, we're going back because we have food in Egypt. We're going back. We're going back to bondage. And God told them through Moses they wouldn't enter. They would have to wander for 40 years in an aimless wandering around in the desert. Only Caleb and Joshua who believed could enter the promised land. And and that right there is at the end of our text when the writer says, well, wasn't all who came out of Egypt under Moses? With whom was God angry for 40 years? Wasn't it with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that he would not enter, they would not enter his rest? If not to those who disobeyed. So we see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. That when we harden our hearts and don't listen to his voice... We bring upon ourselves an aimless wandering, a restless wandering in this life that cannot be satisfied. And based on these texts from the Old Testament, the writer says, watch out, brothers and sisters. Watch out. Be on guard. Be discerning. Turn your spiritual radar on. Watch out, brothers and sisters, so that there won't be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. He says, we can be hardened in our hearts when we cut ourselves off off from the voice of his word so that our hearts turn away. So that a person who has come to faith and, be, and has been saved can turn away and fall away and lose what God has given them. Now that can happen incrementally or it can happen dramatically. And you see, we don't fall away from his grace because we sin. We fall away when our hearts are hardened in unbelief. And sin can can eat away at our faith. And that can happen incrementally when more and more we're distracted and and our hearts harden and and we don't want to hear his voice. We start to not believe the voice of his word and it turns us away from him. And to be turned away from the living God is to be on a path of destruction. And Hebrews is full of these warnings. Chapter 2, and we heard this a couple weeks ago. For this reason... We must pay attention all the more to what we've heard so that we will not drift away. For if the message spoken through angels was legally binding and every transgression and disobedience received a just punishment, how will we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? He has salvation to have mercy and to forgive us of all of our sins and embrace us. But if we turn our backs on that, what do we have? If we neglect that salvation, or Hebrews 10, 26, if we deliberately go on sinning after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin. These are some of the scariest words in the New Testament. But a terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of a fire about to consume the adversaries. See, God is a holy, righteous, merciful fire to purify and cleanse us. But everything that is opposed and resists him, that fire becomes destructive. Because he opposes all that is evil and is wrong. But to those who turn in faith and confess their sin, it purifies and cleanses. And Jesus made this very clear in the Sermon on the Mount. Enter through the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the road broad that leads to destruction, and there are many who go through it. How narrow is the gate and how difficult the road that leads to life, and few find it. 
He says, at any point in time in history, so many are on the broad road. The road that leads to destruction. Destruction in life and after death. And there are so few. And the road is difficult and it's narrow. Now, someone on the narrow road could turn away and end up on the broad road. And someone on the broad road, and all those on the broad road, Jesus wants to redeem them. He wants to bring them to repentance. And yet there are so many on the broad, easy road worshiping other gods, neglecting the salvation he's given. And so we're given this warning to examine our hearts and lives and to to repent. And the Lord's calling us today, where do we need to confess our sin to him? To acknowledge where our hearts have been hardened, where we have been maybe growing indifferent to the voice of his word. Because he urges us, don't let your hearts be turned away from God's word of life. Instead, be encouraged with the life of Christ's body today. Not tomorrow, not next year, today. And when he says in the text, but encourage each other daily while it is still called today. So that none of you is hardened by sin's deception. Notice that. He says, I don't want sin to deceive you. I don't want sin to creep in and start to cause a calcification of your spiritual arteries. And harden you. And and turn you away from him. So what's the remedy for that? The body of Christ. He says, encourage each other daily while it is still called today. The body of Christ, his church, where the life of Christ is at. Now, when we hear the word encourage, you might think of, oh, you know, writing encouragement notes. And, well, it certainly doesn't exclude that, includes that. But this word encourage, he's using the word used by the prophets and by Isaiah. When to encourage God's people was to hear the royal proclamation of Yahweh, the king, who would vindicate his people, who would rescue them from evil, who would judge and destroy the powers of darkness and evil and everything that opposes him, that he redeems his people and will preserve them and bring them through to the end. That is spoken of as the encouragement of God. So that even Paul, talking about the gospel he proclaims, he calls it his word of encouragement. Hebrews calls his letter the word of encouragement. Preaching is described by Paul to Timothy as encouragement to the believers. So the remedy is the body of Christ being together. And in a day and age when people are questioning, I don't know, do we even need the church, you know? just catch podcasts on the phone and, and you know I can just watch and, or I can just self-serve spirituality and just do it on my own but we need to have a greater renewed vision of the church now yes there are those who physically can't make it to the gathering of God's people there are those who have our high risk safety concerns and need to be at home in quarantine, and that's why you're live streaming. Praise God for that tool. But the, here's the encouragement for those who can come and haven't come. The Lord calls you to be a part of the face-to-face gathering of his people. Here is the remedy for apostasy and falling away where we encourage one another each day. So, you know, the believers at that time would meet on Sundays, day of the Lord's resurrection, for preaching of the word, the reading of scripture, celebrate the Lord's Supper, to pray, to praise. And then they would have a meal and they would encourage one another. And often they would meet every single day, even too. But that, that encouragement of the hope, the good news that is in Jesus, as believers together hear his word as it's preached and taught, as they pray together, as they celebrate the Lord's Supper together, as they praise and worship together, and and as they encourage each other together, that was to strengthen them against sin's 
heart-hardening deception. And so to raise up the view of the church in these days when so many are like, I don't think we need that. You know, and it's described in Hebrews in the passage, like I read the beginning of service, as coming into the house of God, to the very presence of Jesus. Since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart. We're coming into his presence. This is an outpost of his kingdom in enemy territory where he's encouraging us, strengthening us for the spiritual battle. He says, and let us consider one another in love. In other words, we do this not only for our own sake, but to consider one another in love to provoke love and good works. We want each other to stay faithful. How does this happen? He says, not neglecting to gather together. Apparently that was starting to happen. It's like, no, you can't do that. You need to keep meeting together in the presence of Jesus together. And all the more as you see the day approaching. Because it's in Jesus that we have life. And so he urges us, hold on to Christ in your union with him, individually and together, in your union with him by faith, and share in his life. You know, the Bible exploration class, I've been saying, this isn't just like a relationship with Jesus where, you know, he's at a distance. By faith, we're united with him. Look at these words. For we have become participants in Christ if we hold firmly until the end the reality that we had at the start. That we are united to Christ to share in his life the reality of his life because he who became one with us, the word that became flesh, who united himself to our sinful humanity, who took our sin, who took our shame, our guilt, our death on himself and died to redeem us. Now when we trust and believe in him, we're united to him and we receive his life. We share, we participate in his life who gives us his righteousness, his holiness. We're reunited with God and not just our status, but that he gives us the divine life to share and participate in a new heart filled with the Holy Spirit. He gives us new thoughts and new desires. We desire to love God and to participate and share in the joy, a happiness that the world can't give, to have a hope that anchors us in this world and to bring us into the peace and the rest of his presence Knowing it's but a foretaste of the promised land to come. Notice, as we hold firmly until the end, the reality we had at the start. And by faith in Christ, trusting in him as he unites us to himself. You know, I think of a lamp, you know, and one day I was was like, why is this lamp not on? And I realized, oh, it got unplugged. Jesus plugs us back in. He reunites us. We're united to him, the source of divine life and power. And once that happens, we have his righteousness, his holiness. We're united to him. That electrical current runs through the cord and lights up the bulb as it shares in the electrical current. And it's the same with us. As we hold on to Christ and faith together as his body, his divine life courses into us to light up our lives. As we hold on to that, To the end. No matter what we face. No matter what struggles. No matter what trials. And he gives us the strength to have the discernment. And to guard against all the seductive pressures. Of the cell phone. Of technology. Of temptation. Of everything in this world. And I would just. One suggestion as I bring this to a close. The book Redeeming Technology. New book. Fellow. LCMS, Michigan pastor Trevor Sutton, and Christian psychiatrist, A Christian Approach to Healthy Digital Habits. Excellent book. I wish I'd had this 10 years ago. I would have done things differently. So here's a warning. Don't throw away your confidence. 
which has a great reward. For you need endurance so that after you've done God's will, you may receive what was promised. Hold on to Christ over against. And sometimes it's going to mean having times of quiet, shutting it off, saying no, learning discipline, to use it wisely in a godly way. Because at the end of the day, the fire of God's holy, just love, everything else will get burned up. The only thing that will remain is the word of God and Christ as the word. He endures forever. There was a great news account about a church in West Virginia. Freedom Ministries Church had a devastating fire that was just engulfed the whole building. And it was so intense that they had to call several fire departments. And, uh, and then at one point, the fire was so hot, they had to step back from it. And it literally burned the whole building down. And uh, I remember when this happened a few years ago. But afterwards, they were absolutely shocked by what they found. This was like a divine sign. A post on the department's Facebook page. In your mind, everything should be burned, ashes. But not a single Bible was burned. And not a single cross was harmed. Can you imagine that? The whole building burns out. And they have pictures on their Facebook site, the fire department. The Bibles were unharmed. The cross was unharmed. The rest of the bur- building was burned down. And he said no single firefighter was hurt. He says, the, though the odds were against us, God was not. What a beautiful, supernatural sign and picture Though everything else will get consumed, God's word alone will endure. And that word is about Christ, who as the son of God gave his life for you and me so that we would know life. It's not in this or anything that the world offers. It's in him who brings us into the promised land to know his perfect joy and peace, that rest that we will experience in his presence forever and ever. Hold on to that for life. Please stand. As we call on the Lord in prayer, Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank you for the truth of your word. And we pray in this, these dangerous times, oh Lord, when we are being attacked and our faith is being battered in so many ways that you would preserve and guard us by the truth of your word, that your Holy Spirit would be at work in our hearts to keep us connected and united to you and to each other as the body of Christ. Lord, that we would share in your life and that would, that would fill us with your wisdom, that would fill us, Lord, with your joy and with your peace, Lord, in a way that, Lord, would, would guard and keep us away from the enticements of the enemy and give us the wisdom and discipline, Lord, to know how to use technology in a godly way, to redeem it, that we may resist its destructive influence for us Pray for parents and for children. And Lord, I know there is so much damage that has been done. And I pray, Lord, that you would give us divine wisdom and direction to know how best to utilize it in a way, Lord, that we do not succumb to its destructive evil influences. So we pray for your church. We pray for your family, for the families of this congregation. And Lord, for those who grieve, Lord, we pray for your comfort as we continue to lift up the Ripple family. Lord, we pray as Tony lost his brother John, just comfort and encourage him. Lord, for Sandy Fairbank's brother-in-law, Doug Wilson, who is in the hospital with COVID on a ventilator. Lord, we lift him up and pray for supernatural intervention, for healing, that you restore him to health. And Lord, we just lift up to you those that are sick or ill, those that we know, 
and pray that you would touch their bodies and heal them. And all the needs here present in this place, Lord, we lift up to you with the glad and joyful confidence that you hear us. And Father, we just lift our concerns to you at this time and pray that you give us a joyful hope and confidence. And Lord, we also lift up Dennis Holmes, who was hit by a car on the bridge, and is, the, is in the hospital with broken ribs and shoulder. Uh, Lord, that you would heal him and restore him from this accident. Lord, these and all other petitions we offer before your throne. Lord, with the joyful, glad confidence that you will lead your people to the promised land of your heavenly presence, hear us as we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
may the grace of your Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be and abide with you and preserve you to life everlasting. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. I want to encourage you to stay for our Bible exploration, which will last till noon. And then at noon, we're going to have lunch together. Uh, to support our youth for the National Youth Gathering. So if you will, I believe we're still just this section. Uh, chairs five high and to the walls. And uh, in about 10 minutes or so, we'll meet back for our Bible exploration. Adults in here, kids in the ark, if you can stay, that'd be great. Otherwise, have a blessed week. And uh, may the Lord strengthen you this week. Amen.